I'm good. Ah, brilliant. Okay, so we are meeting. We are we are meeting once again at the time where we now in we now we now need we are on on the final stretch with our revision. Uh, the the remarks. Uh, le let me just give you some few remarks before we just hit the ground running for today. Oh, if I may share my screen, there are certain things. Oh, I'm already sharing my screen. Uh, you know what? This I will repeat because I, 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 I say it often and often. Time management has been identified as the main reason contributing to suboptimal performance by students. And the only best way to gauge if you are really on track with time management is to make sure that you answer both sections because both sections are compulsory. Compulsory, as I always say, doesn't mean they have to be answered. Not, 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 of course, there's an element of answering, but compulsory means you have to pass both sections for you to pass AFM. Compulsory means examiners are looking at, you know, examiners are looking at a are saying for them to award you the AFM qualification, you must display competencies in section A and competencies in section B, which are independently of each other. Should you fail a section, it's not offset by more marks you get elsewhere. So that one is very, very, very important. Okay, another thing is, please don't ignore the discursive parts of the questions. That's, these are the main sources of easy marks. Don't you have this orientation that um, you need to focus more on, on, on workings, calculations? Not really. You get a lot of marks on the discursive parts of the question. Quite a lot. As you shall notice, we want to pivot our attention to the discursive parts of the questions. And also, uh, when you're given formulas, don't don't struggle much trying to copy the formula again. We don't give marks for you copying the formula and then putting input variables. Everything that we are given, like formula, there are no there's no credit for you to copy that. And professional skills marks, that is another issue. Professional skills marks are available, are normally given for demonstrating. Let me close the, the door, just, just a second. Okay, sorry for that team and back. So my point was professional skills marks are so important. These are these are a feature in 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 your in your in your exam. And the beauty about professional skills marks is, if you notice, in all my videos, all of them, I was embedding them when I was teaching. In other words, I would say this is how you put it, and this is how you 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 explain it to the examiner, and quite a lot. So that one is covered, and I'm super confident because in in September, we recorded 75% pass rate in our class, and it was mainly due to, it was mainly due to, to okay, sorry, just a second. Hello, Seku. Okay, sorry for that. So I was saying professional skills marks, especially commercial acumen, evaluation skills. Evaluation, we are saying, look, produce a balanced argument and then reach a logical conclusion. Always remember to reach a conclusion when you're evaluating. Analysis skills, they imply inquiring on how a variable will impact on another variable like factors which will determine our success in a foreign project that we want to, in, to venture into. 
when you are when you are giving you professional skills marks for demonstrating analysis skills what you are basically saying is identify a variable and then go a step further into inquiring how this particular variable is going to impact on the as item or aspect that the examiner is asked you to consider. That's analysis skills. Commercial acumen meaning, as you are presenting your points, try to put these points in a manner which is business related, in a manner which shows awareness to external and internal environmental variables affecting the business, and also something which is actionable. So commercial acumen borders on you speaking like a business person speaking like a business person. That, that's basically what commercial acumen is about. When you're suggesting your points, make sure they are actionable. They can be conceived in a business sense and put to work. Communication is about clarity and uh, absence of vagueness, presenting your points in a manner which convicts the audience, which is normally the board of directors to act based on your advice. Now, uh, now, these are recurring themes, major and acquisitions, especially on business valuation. We all know that number one is on advanced investment appraisal. So it's not like, say, can you tell us, can you spot for us? It is specifically mentioned in the syllabus that question one is either on majors and acquisitions or advanced investment appraisal. Now, wh what you need to ask yourself is, what really then constitutes advanced investment appraisal? Issues like appraising a foreign project comes under advanced investment appraisal. Issues like a project with embedded options, options to expand, options to delay, option to dispose, it forms under advanced um, investment appraisal. A advanced investment appraisal may also include computing APV, you know, adjusted present value. This issue of adjusting for, for, for the debt financing side effects, computation of base case NPV, um, a determination of, as you compute the base case NPV, determination of of, of cost of equity, which is ungeared, meaning cost of equity computed using asset beta, not equity beta. So it may require you to ungear, to get asset beta, and then use asset beta to come up with cost of equity, which is ungeared, and that is then used to calculate what? Base case NPV. On majors and acquisitions, always remember the theoretical parts, stuff like reverse major, when, when, when a company which is unlisted is, is acquiring a company which is already listed, what are the benefits we get from that? A regulatory framework, remember? The regulatory frameworks on majors and acquisitions, you know, the principle of equal treatment, uh, the, 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 the issue of squeeze out rights, the, the, the mandatory bid rules. Make sure you know that and you earn easy marks from this. If you don't have this, I'm sure you, you all you have to do is to play your sales videos. I have explained this pretty cool. Now, uh, what we want to focus on today is, I know you are, you are, you are highly, deeply uh, involved in this revision phase, and uh, I want to gauge the extent of your preparedness as well. Uh, allow me to send... The paper. I just. I. 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 I'm. I'm. I've. I've more biased towards the theory parts today. You know. I. I really like calculations, but at times, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, okay. Let me open. The paper. This. This question is also amongst. Uh, Debriefed question in our question bank. Uh, okay. Right. Where is it? Let me delete this. Let me close that. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, we, let, let us just read along as we. 
right now coca mocha chai cmc is a large listed company based in switzerland and uses swiss francs as its currency it imports tea coffee and coca from countries around the world and sells its blended products to supermarkets and large retailers worldwide the company is production facilities located in two European ports where raw materials are brought for processing and from where finished goods are shipped out. All raw material purchases are paid for in uh, US dollars while all sales are invoiced in Swiss franc. Until recently, CMC had no intention of aging its foreign currency exposures, interest rate exposures, commodity price fluctuations, and stated this intent in its annual report. However, after consultations with senior uh, and middle managers, the company's board of directors has been reviewing its risk management and operational strategies. So in other words, we are being told that the company has never been involved in aging. So the recent board meeting is now causing the firm to review its risk management and operational strategies. The, follow, uh, the following two proposals have been put forward by the board for further consideration. Proposal one, setting up a treasure function to manage the foreign currency and interest rate exposures but not commodity price fluctuations using derivative products. The treasury function would be aided by the finance director. The purchasing director who initiated the idea of having a treasury function was of the opinion that this would enable a management team to make better decisions. The finance director also supported the idea as he felt this would increase his influence on board of directors and strengthen his case for an increase in his remuneration. In order to assist in the, further, uh, in the further consideration of this proposal, the board wants you to use the following upcoming foreign currents and interest rate exposures to demonstrate how they will be managed by the treasury function. A payment of uh, a payment of 5 million US Remember, the, the, this company is based in Switzerland. It's a Swiss, it's a Swiss firm whose currency is the Swiss franc. So it is intending to pay five million and sixty, which is due in four months' time. And also, it is a four-year sixty million loan taken out to to part fund the setting up of four branches. See proposal two below. So there is, it, it wants to make a payment, a US payment, and it also wants to take out the loan. So you can see the risk here. So this company is facing currency risk. The same company is facing interest rate risk. The interest will be payable on the loan at a fixed annual rate of 2,2 or a floating annual rate based on the yield curve plus 40 basis points. Or, or let's say plus 0.4 percent. The loan is principal amount will be repayable in full at the end of the fourth year. When they say the loan is principal amount will be repayable in full at the end of the fourth year, it means uh, arrangement is it's not going to be amortized for now. So proposal two, this proposal suggested setting up four new branches in four different countries. Each branch would have its own production facilities and sales teams. As a consequence of this, one of the two European-based uh, production facilities would be closed. Initial cost benefit analysis indicated that this would reduce costs related to production, distribution, and logistics, as these branches would be, would be closer uh, to the sources of raw materials and also the, to the customers. The operations and sales director supported the proposal 
as in addition to above this uh, as in addition to above this would enable sales and marketing teams in the branches to respond to any changes in nearby markets more quickly the branches would be controlled and staffed by local population in those countries however some members of the board expressed the concern that such a move would create agents issues between cmc central management and the management controlling the branches they suggested mitigation strategies would need to be established to minimize these issues. Response from non-executive directors. When the proposals were put to the non-executive directors, they indicated that they were broadly supportive of the second proposal if the financial benefits outweigh costs of setting up and running the four branches. However, they felt that they could not support the first proposal as this would reduce shareholder value because the costs related to undertaking the proposal are likely to outweigh the benefits. Additional information relating to proposal one. The current spot rate is 1065 per Swiss franc uh, and the current annual rate is uh, in US is three times higher than that of Switzerland. Annual inflation rate. The following derivative products are available to CMC to manage exposures of the US dollar payment and the interest on the loan. Exchange traded current futures. So these are the six months, uh, three month expiry and uh, six months uh, expire. So these are these are current futures. Then exchange traded uh, current options so these are options contract size uh, contract size and 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 the premium so premium as you can see you are being given that these are cents per swiss franc so these are dollars so to speak cents means dollars per swiss franc so you need to know which which contracts then do you have to take It can be assumed that futures and, and option price expire at the end of the month and transaction costs related to these can be ignored. Then, over the counter products, in addition to the exchange traded products, Petunia or Petunia Bank is willing to offer the following over the counter derivative products, meaning a forward rate between US and Swiss franc per 10, 1,0677 per Swiss franc, uh, an interest rate swap contract with a counterparty, where the counterparty can borrow at an annual floating rate based on the yield curve plus 80 basis points. Sorry, allow me to answer this call just, hey. Hello? Yes. Ah, okay, wonderful. Sorry, I'm in a lecture. Just send me a WhatsApp message. I will respond as soon as I'm done. Yes, sure. Welcome. Oh, sorry for that. So I was on point number two, which is saying an interest rate swap contract with a counterpart where the counterpart can borrow at an annual floating rate based on the yield curve plus 0.8 percent you know you can it can be called 80 basis points or a fixed rate of 3.8 percent Petunia bank would charge a fee of 20 basis points to each uh, to each to act as the intermediary of the swap both parties will benefit equally from the swap contract now first question is advise cmc on the appropriate aging strategies to manage the foreign exchange exposure of the payment in four months time show all relevant calculations including the number of contracts uh, bought or sold in the exchange traded derivative markets so clearly clearly you are being told by the examiner here that they want to they want you to come up with how we measure the five million dollar payment when using the products available be it forward exchange contracts or current options or even 
current features. Then determine how CMC will benefit from the swap. So this is again, a swap is, a, is an over-the-counter derivative uh, uh, contract allowing, uh, allowing parties to exchange, in this case, payment of interest rate. Then as an alternative to paying the principal on the loan is one lump sum at the end of the fourth year, meaning they no longer want to pay the loan as a lump sum payment at the end of the fourth year. CMC company could pay off the loan in equal annual in, in equal annual amounts over the four year over four years, similar to an annuity. So if the loan is to be paid in equal annual amounts, it means it's now going to be amortized. That is what amortization means, payment in equal annual amounts. In this case, interest rate of 2% would be payable, which is the same as the loan's gross redemption yield. Now, uh, required, calculate the modified duration of the loan if it is repaid in equal amounts and explain how duration can be used to measure sensitivity of the loan to interest rate changes. Now, prepare a, a memorandum for the Board of Directors of CMC, which discusses Proposal 1 in light of the concerns raised by non-executive directors, 9 marks. Discuss urgent issues related to Proposal 2 and how these can be mitigated, 9 marks. So professional skills marks are awarded for demonstrating structure, logical flow, and clarity of the memorandum. So in a question like this, in a question like this, this, this is a now, these are now, you know, it's like final touches because by the next time, next week, you'll be preparing for your exam. When you're answering a question like this, oh, Kuzi, you are in, you are in, uh, remember I'm answering the, the very question you were, you, were, you were asking me, right? In that audio. And I felt like, let me, let me answer it in class so that everyone will benefit. Uh, when when you are, when we have a question like this make sure you get there are a lot of easy marks on the theory parts can you imagine theory alone has got 18 marks actually 22 marks in this paper theory alone has got 22 marks so i want you to develop this attitude towards theory make sure you actually tackle the theory parts if you feel if you have uh, realized that it has nothing to do with workings that 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 we have done you have to all oh, that had to be done you have to tackle the theory parts i understand i understand um noma you appreciate that theory is the source of easy marks from the other subjects that i have taught you now, so let's start with D. Prepare a memorandum for the board. I'm not going to, 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 to draft a memorandum because I know you know that, but I want us to discuss. The memorandum should discuss proposal one in light of the concerns raised by non-executive directors. The same memorandum should also discuss urgent issues related to proposal two and how these can be mitigated. So we need to go to proposal one and two. So let me come back briefly to these two proposals. I will, I will be paraphrasing. Now, on proposal one, please pay attention. It's saying let us set the treasure function because this company had not been into aging and the treasure is to be identified by the finance director. And the, the purchasing director is also supporting this idea because he's saying it will in, this would enable her to make uh, a uh, management team to make better decisions. Also, the finance director is saying, look, since I will be heading treasury, it is going to strengthen his uh, case for increase in remuneration and also for this person to be powerful at the board. Uh, so they are saying, let us have this treasure division to age these two upcoming exposures. There's a payment of five million and sixty US dollars, and also a loan of sixty million that we want to take. 
So these are the exposures, current exposures and interest rate exposures. This is the first task that the treasury function is going to, to do. Proposal number two, they are saying, look, let us set up new branches in four different countries. That's proposal number two. And they are saying, uh, this, there are a lot of benefits. They are saying this will reduce costs related to production, distribution, logistics, and a whole lot of other stuff. And also, it will, be, it will enable these to respond to markets more quickly. And it will be staffed by local management. No, we are setting branches in, in, in four countries. We require managers from those countries. They, 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 they will have like interface with customers and the, a lot of other synergistic benefits, be it production, distribution, logistics, and stuff. Even access to raw materials and also to nearer to customers. But the finance, the, the, <clears throat> the, the, the the board is saying, look, when you have such a situation where you set branches and decentralize management of these branches, there are likely to be urgent issues and we have to, to sort out how these urgent issues must be minimized. Make sure you address the urgent issues. Now, these two proposals are now submitted to a non-executive director, to non-executive directors. And the non-executive directors are saying, look, we support proposal two. They are saying we support proposal two if benefits outweigh costs of these four branches. So the, the non-executive directors are saying we support setting up of branches and staffing these branches with local population or decentralize the operations. However, concerning proposal two, I mean concerning the first proposal which is about setting up the uh, treasury division, they could not support this proposal. Why? Because they are saying costs are likely to outweigh the benefits. So they are not. They are, they are saying we, we don't want to support proposal two. I mean, we don't want to support proposal one of setting up the treasury function. Now, with this is the case. Now, the question is now is saying. The question is now saying. Prepare a memorandum for the board of directors, which discusses proposal one in light of the concerns raised by non-executive directors. Are you getting the question? Non-executive directors are saying, we don't want to set up treasury division. Why? Because costs are likely to outweigh benefits. So we are not supporting or setting up of a treasury division. Now the question is, discuss proposal one in light of the concerns raised by non-executive director. These are the questions you face. And imagine, nine months for that. So it boils down to what, are, what really are we saying? So, so can you, you have to break it down that non-executive directors are saying, we, there's no need for treasure function because it's costly and it will reduce shareholder wealth. So you, you have to discuss proposal one in the light of the concerns, meaning as you are discussing proposal one, extend your tentacles to tell us whether the director's suggestion is valid. You are discussing. It's like you are, you want, the non-executive directors, whatever they are saying, is it, they are, are they saying the truth when they say setting up of a treasury function will reduce shareholder wealth. In other words, in what way is setting up of treasure function not going to reduce risks and preserve shareholder wealth? That's what they are saying. We want to validate if, if what they are saying is really predicated on, 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 on sound grounds. So in a question like this, it's easy. It's easy. You know, this family did not, you know, this family didn't have treasury function before. In other words, it didn't have a dedicated responsibility and department in charge of the treasury function. 
So clearly, setting up the treasury function, it frees management time. You know, management, in, instead of concentrating on their specific areas like marketing, production, operations, they are also focusing on aging. But they don't have a separate treasury function. So having a separate treasury function, it, it actually now gives risk management under its remit or under its responsible personnel, responsible department, and other managers can now focus on their key or critical areas. On the, on the, on the, on the short of it, this is like the overall overarching benefit of having a treasure function. You know, it's, it's, it's staffed by experts who are experts in aging, and in so doing, the exposures are also dealt with, especially the significant ones, which are upcoming. But the non-executive directors are saying, this is not going to contribute to shareholder wealth, because we want to discuss their concerns. How? They are saying costs are likely to outweigh the benefits. So let us look at what is it that non-executive directors are actually saying? What is it they are saying? You know, cap in, 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 when you are talking of managing investor funds, these funds, you are told that CMC is a listed company. So capital markets can be perfect or imperfect. You know that capital markets can be described as perfect and imperfect. In a perfect capital market, you know, shareholders are able to hold a well diversified portfolio, which eliminates unsystematic risk and only face systematic risk. This happens in a perfect capital market. Let me repeat, in a perfect capital market, shareholders are able to hold a well diversified portfolio which does away or which eliminates unsystematic risk and they only face systematic risk and what is systematic risk it's a risk you can't avoid so if capital markets are perfect there's no benefit for aging if capital markets are perfect there is no benefit for aging. Why? Because investors can only face systematic risk, which is unavoidable. So the suggestion from non-executive director that setting up a treasury function is not going to, to benefit or to, to increase shareholder wealth. It may be true, assuming that capital markets are perfect. There is no need for aging because you can't age systematic risk. You are going to face it anyway. It's called an unavoidable or market risk. So non-executive director is saying, let us not set up treasure function because it's costly. You can say what these guys are saying concerns they are saying. It may hold true under the assumption that capital markets are perfect. Because in such a market, the risks that investors face is only systematic, which you can't do anything about it, whether you hedge, you have a treasury department, or you don't. But now CMC is listed in Switzerland. And we know that Switzerland doesn't have a perfect capital market. We know that. There's no market in the world which is perfect. So because CMC is listed on Swiss, it's, it's, it's listed, there's no stock market at present which is perfect. So it means investors are facing unsystematic and systematic risk. Shareholders are facing both unsystematic and systematic risk. Now, setting up a treasure function then would then give this and systematic risk within the responsible care of estimates, or of, I mean, of experts who will come up with the aging strategies to read company or investors of this. So, concerns by directors that treasure function is of no is is not worth it may not hold true in this case because 
CMC is in an imperfect market where unsystematic risk exposures are also facing investors. So having a treasure function may actually contribute to shareholder wealth. However, in general, whether treasure function in setting up, uh, in, in coming up with aging uh, practices, it depends on how rampant or how diverse are the exposures the company is facing, and also whether you know the existing the existing aging strategies without the treasure function, uh, the the costs of running this are they going to hire new personnel and stuff? All these taken together may may even lead to treasure being expensive, but overall. Treasure function has to be set up considering the significant exposures that CMC is facing. Also, considering that CMC is in an imperfect market where unsystematic risk is faced by investors, which can only be reduced by hedging. In an imperfect market, you cannot have a, a, a well diversified portfolio, which eliminates unsystematic risk on its own. It's not possible. You can only do that by aging. Right. Uh, sorry, 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 guys. You know, today, 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 as you can see, I'm just, I just sort of talking to you, as I'm saying. Are you not seeing that Easy Max, they were Easy Max there, Gladys? I'm, I'm going to the next part. Yes, uh, there is Max. But are you not seeing that if you don't appreciate that theory questions are a source of easy marks, you may say, oh, say, what is it that I have to write on this? You know, someone is putting bluntly to you and say, I don't want you to set up treasure function because it's costly. And then the question is, can you discuss this concern in your memo? You are validating whether you are having a balanced argument here. It's, the question can say, evaluate non-executive director's claim. It may be the same question. Setting up a treasure function is costly. Can you evaluate that? It's a matter of saying what are the benefits of treasure function at CMC? And then introduce the concerns which directors are saying. They are saying even though these are the benefits, but it's costly. So you can then say, look, to an extent I agree with you that in a perfect capital market, it's possible for, for, for shareholders or investors to just hold a well diversified portfolio. So there's no need for there's no need for aging because investors only face systematic risk. So having a treasure function indeed it will be costly. But in this case, we are not dealing with a perfect market. Here we are dealing with an imperfect market, which is CMC listed company. And a listed, there's no market which is perfect. To the extent of that, investors now they are facing both systematic and unsystematic risk. And you know that systematic risk can it, it need to be reduced, but in an imperfect market, you don't reduce it by diversification. Because it's not possible to hold a well diversified portfolio in an imperfect market. So how do you come and deal with that? You set up a treasure function. But still, they are saying it's costly. It's not like by setting a treasure function already, it's no longer costly. Treasure personnel is expensive. So there's a lot that we then have to consider. It's not like just because FD is saying wants his remuneration to be increased by adding the treasure function. So let us look at all that. Is it really worth it in this particular company? Now, this company trades in various countries. It has customers in various countries. It, it, it sources raw materials in other countries. So clearly it's exposure. It's like on a daily, it's, it's like a, a daily routine for these current exposures. With that, a, a treasure function would be beneficial because as you can see, management currently is hooked up into treasury, yet by dedicating responsibility for hedging with the treasury, it frees management time and focuses on. You, you, you are being practical, you know. When, the way I'm explaining this, Rachi, is called evaluation skills, number one. It's also called commercial acumen. Am I putting it in a manner that is difficult to understand, uh, Norma? Am I putting it in a textbook issue or I'm being practical? Yeah, 
They are being practical. Yes, if you can yes. attest to that. Oh, well, if you can attest to that, we call it commercial acumen. So when they say professional skills marks are being given to demonstrate commercial acumen, they are saying, don't give us textbook stuff, be practical. Number two, uh, as I said, I have a bias towards theory today. Discuss agents issues related to proposal two and how these can be mitigated. Discuss agents issues related to proposal two and how these can be mitigated. Now proposal two, remember if I've gone through it just now, it's about we want to set branches in four different countries and we want to give managers in those countries running those countries branches. Now, when this proposal is presented to non-executive directors, non-executive directors are saying, look, we support it, but as we support it, be careful of the urgent issues which arise and come up with mitigation mechanisms to manage these issues. Now, the question is now discuss, it's in your memo, discuss urgent issues related to proposal two and how these can be mitigated. Now, it boils down to what is meant by urgent issue. You know, urgent issue, when you see that question like urgent issue, the question on urgent issues, it, it, it's looking at, such a question is looking at, do we really have urgent relationships in the first place? And if yes, who is the principal, who is the agent, and how is this relationship cemented? So we have got CME, CMC central management team, and then we do have branch management teams. So the CMC central management teams, and they, if we set up these branches, there will be branch management team. So clearly, shareholders of the CMC are the dominant, the main principal, and central management is the agent. Also, central management need to supervise branch management because they report to CMC central management. So the branch management are in, on, in themselves principal, are, are the agents of central management. So central management in that capacity is also the principal. Also, the branch management are representing central management. So clearly they have to represent that in good faith. So central management becomes principal and branch management becomes agent. This is called agents issue. When they say discuss agent issues, so these are the agent issue. And then, so there are instances when there's need to make sure that whatever the branch management is doing is aligned or there's go congruence with the objectives which are set by the board in general and central management in particular. When management, when branch management pursue their own objectives, there is what is then we call agents problem. So how do we mitigate agents problem? Because the question says how they can be mitigated. Talk to me. How do you ensure that those who are running branches in other countries are not acting in their own interests, but rather they are serving the central management's interest? How would you bridge that agent's problem? In other words, how would you ensure go congruence there? Talk to yourself, you can unmute and talk to yourself, or you can, you can type in the chat here. How do you ensure that there's go congruence between head office management and, 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 and branch management? I'm trying to motivate. Right. Uh, can you type in the chat? Or let, 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 let us make use of typing in the chat. Let us type in the chat. I, I'm, I'm not getting it clearly. I'm seeing one person typing, team, let us type. Reserve, reserving some decisions for head office. Mm -hmm. 
implement suitable corporate governance procedures. All right, you guys are stars. I'm seeing typing there. Seeing you typing. Setting up internal controls, implement performance based remuneration, motivate the manager by giving incentives like performance bonus. Okay, wonderful. So you can really see, you can really see that this question was easy. Uh, these are this is basic stuff. Basically, introduce commercial acumen in doing so. In as much as you are communicating, introduce commercial acumen. Try by all means to be to be try by all means to be practical. Try by all means to be practical. So you can see you can say you set targets for branches for branch managers which are aligned with the overall mission of the company. And then use those to base remuneration, achievement of those targets to base remuneration. Are you not seeing, I have said performance-based remuneration, but I have said it in a commercial acumen way. I haven't said it in a textbook way. Always try to do that. That's how we pass. ACC exams because you work in a business. Try to be to say when setting targets for branch managers, let them align with the overall mission of CMC, and then then remuneration. Let it then be based on the extent of achievement of those targets, and then the branch managers. Someone said reserve certain decisions for central management correct so you you would say major decisions may may require central management approval or shareholder approval if they are going to impact greatly on the uh, on the on the on, on, on the company we may actually have shareholders vote on the resolutions which these guys are proposing another is CMC is listed, so clearly it means corporate governance practices, let them be introduced or let them apply consistently throughout the branches. Let us have these corporate governance guidelines. Another is internal controls. Yes, we have to, we need to have internal controls which maintain the integrity of this agency relationship so that it is not subject to uh, to, to violations. Another might be awarding shares, bonus, performance bonus. You, you, you were right on that. You were right on that. So that's it. Then let us now come to the, the so in an exam, in an exam, this one had 22 marks. Remember, each mark carries 1,8 minutes. So this part, for this part of the question, you had uh, how many minutes? 22 marks. So you'll be typing, you'll be typing, got a lot of typing there. So it will be like equals, uh, let's say equals 22 multiplied by 1,8. You had 40 minutes. This is how you, we have to be planning. And you can see we did not even spend all these minutes. We are done with that. So the beauty about tackling theory parts is it gives you time to remove tension, anxiety. You relax whilst you are thinking how to tackle the questions on derivatives. Required advice, CMC, you know, your current paper setting, it's no longer like advice. It may say write a report to the board. I'm sure from the videos that we have been, we have been using for our revisions, all that aspect is well catered for. Now, advise CMC on the appropriate aging strategy. So, to, to manage foreign exchange exposure. So, this one has nothing to do with the loan so far. It's about payment to US that we want to make. So, this is, we want to make a payment to US of 5 million and 60 here. 
it is to be paid in four months time. So we can age using, we are aging using derivative products, both exchange traded and over the counter like futures and also like forward. So, so when you when you when you are answering this, you you know your sales style. Your sales style, you can say the for the USD, USD five million and sixty, five million and sixty, uh, you to be paid, to be paid in four months time months time can you have can you have its exchange rate risk used using exchange rate risk used using so so you you take from the products that we have so you say you can edge this using forward exchange contracts forward forward exchange contracts contracts uh, forward exchange contracts uh, then uh, currency futures currency currency futures you can equally edge this using even even current options current options there are current features, current options, which you can use now. Forward outcome. Forward outcome. Forward outcome. So you want to, you, you know, you want to pay five million and sixty in four months' time, and this is the forward. You get forward on under over the counter derivatives. So this is the forward. So all you have to do is to, uh, you know, you pay, you, you are going to pay at this, you know, forward is when you are fixing the exchange rate that you are going to use. So $1,0677 per each Swiss franc. So forward outcome is like, uh, uh, you say the, the CHF, Swiss franc cost to the firm from forward from forward exchange contract is so you are, you are going to 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 age five million and sixty divided by one comma one comma zero six seven seven make sure you are able to read the exchange rate. This is I, I always mention in my videos that this is a grave mistake. If you don't know how to exchange, this is saying one comma zero six dollars per Swiss franc. So clearly, Swiss franc Swiss francs have more value than dollars. So if you are converting from dollars to Swiss franc, you should get fewer Swiss franc. So you divide. Okay, so you say. So this is Swiss franc cost of payment from forward equals five zero six zero divided by uh, one zero one comma sorry zero six seven seven. So this so from forward this is the amount that that you pay, and then you can use futures. Now current futures or the Swiss franc futures, you get that. By currency, so, so you can say currency futures. Currency futures. Currency futures. Now, for, for, for currency futures, you need, to know, you need to know something. You check whether, as I always say, check whether the, the, the contract currency is the same as the exposure currency. I always say when you under normal circumstances, notice under normal circumstances, when you under normal circumstances, when you're expecting to pay foreign currency, what you do now, 
is you buy the currency futures now and then sell them later to close your market position. You remember that? If you're expecting to pay foreign currency, what do you do? Buy currency futures now and then sell them later to close your market position. But this statement only is only valid if the exposure currency is the same as the futures currency. In other words, when you are expecting to pay euros, futures are priced in euros. Or when you're expecting to pay euros, contracts, futures contracts are in euros. That's where we say, are you expecting to pay? So buy euro futures. If you're expecting to pay euros and, cont and contract sizes are in euros. But if it's the opposite, that contract currency is different from your exposure currency. Like in this case, we're expecting to pay uh, US and our futures are in Swiss franc. You do the opposite because you have to, to use your own currency to, to, to buy the US. So what you are then doing is you sell current futures. When you're making a payment, and the contract currency is different from your exposure currency. Don't go the usual way of buying currency futures, rather sell. That statement is important. Another statement is, we want to make a payment in four months time. So I always tell you that if you, are, if you want to make a payment in four months time, clearly you go by what? Six months expired. These futures which are expiring in six months. These are the futures that you can use to age a four month payment. So you then say, the firm, the firm sells, you now understand this. The firm sells. When you are selling, we are actually saying you go short, goes short, goes short. Uh, that, that's, that's what you mean by selling, goes short on six months futures contracts, six months uh, CHF uh, futures contracts now. CHF futures contracts now, uh, now. So this is statement or already, it gives you marks because you know. Please, if you have issues, if you have issues with any of these, let me know now. If you, if you still have issues on whether you are aging interest rates, whether you are aging currents, it's the same. Let me divert you a little bit. You know that for you to borrow money, you have to issue things. Suppose you want to borrow money with debentures, you sell debentures, you know that? If you are borrowing money with debentures, you sell debentures. So if you are a borrower and you are aging interest rate, using interest rate futures, you, 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 you assume the selling side of the market. In other words, you go short. Borrowers sell interest rate futures now. If you are a lender, you lend money by buying. You don't lend money by selling. So if you are a lender or an investor, you age interest rate risk by buying interest rate futures. Actually, I have a video where I've explained this, so let me not con con contaminate the current discussion. If you, have, if you haven't if you played that video, let me know. I will send it to your inbox. It's in our WhatsApp class group. Make sure you get all these from our WhatsApp class group. What I mean by WhatsApp class groups is because I have a lot of videos. You may run the risk of playing the video, which is not the one. So when you are playing the video, don't just go to my YouTube channel. Some of the videos are when the syllabus was not yet having these demands. So make sure you are using the videos. You take the link from our WhatsApp class. It will take you to the relevant video. That way we, it's a path of less errors. So you now understand now that the firm sells or goes short six months futures contracts now. now for you to find the number of contracts, notice, you are expecting to pay US and these futures, or notice, these futures are in Swiss, Swiss franc, so you can't divide 
you can't divide 5 million by 125, 5 million US by 125 Swiss franc. You can't do that. You can't do that. So what do you do? You need to find the you need to find the exchange rate that you are going to use on futures. And for you to do that, you need what is called basis. You need to calculate what is called basis first. Basis. Now, basis is it's basically the you you have you have a spot price. Spot price. By spot price, we mean exchange rate, which is on the six month futures. That's it's called a price. So, uh, I, I mean, the, the current spot rate is uh, this one. The current spot is 1,0635. So if we come here, you say spot price 1,0635. And then six months futures price, six months futures price, Six months futures price, you just come to six months futures price and take 1,0659. 1,0659. ,0 so what we have is six months base. Is that that's 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 the basis there. The the basis uh, basis points or movement in exchange rates. So the exchange rate is moved by as we can see, it's increasing. It is moved by these bases. So what we then have to do is, we are exiting the market in four months. We are not exiting the market in six months. So we need then to find the exchange rate at which we are going to exit the market. That is called closing futures price. And clearly you can see that the closing futures price is between these two. You start with 10,635, you close with 10,659 after six months. So what will be the four month rate? The four month rate is between the two. So we just we just assume that these bases are to decrease uniformly. That's what this statement means when they say it can be assumed that the, 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 the there's a statement here which says it can be assumed that futures and options expire at the end of each month. So we are, we are, we are, we can spread this basis over six months so that we can fix expected closing futures price. So you say expected closing futures price. You know, when you when you say I'm teaching you this, I'm don't I'm not even thinking at all. These things I know them like I'm I'm just telling a story or something. You, I'm sure you, you have noticed it from all my videos. I don't even know when I last held a textbook or something. Why am I saying this? It's, you, can, you can relate from your say. Have you ever seen me teaching and I'm reading some? And I, it, it just comes spontaneously. It's, with, it's wired within me. That's what I want you to do. Don't say say is learned too much. No, 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 not at all. A lot of question practice. If a topic appears like it's difficult, be inspired by your say. Why is it I'm having issues with free cash flows? Yet my say just says these things like it's nobody's business. Question, ask yourself that question. Calm down, relax, play your say's video and again be inspired. Eh? Talking, talking of Talking of um, talking of uh, free cash flows, you remember free cash flows to equity is also known as dividend capacity. Remember that. So you may be told that the firm is to be valued using dividend capacity, and then you wonder. First thought is if it, if the company is to be valued using dividend capacity, so it's a dividend growth model. No, you are being asked there to calculate free cash flows to equity. You know, these things are just coming up. You know, when you are now about to write exam, everything just pops. OK, um, so closing futures price, it's, it's just use linear interpolation. Some may say, say, it appears they start with the futures and then they subtract basis. It is that they, 
they start with the sport and the aid basis. Oh, don't, 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 don't think like that that way. Play your sales video and understand how I said it. I said it has to be between the two. So it depends on which one, which from where are you starting? If you are starting with 10,659, 10, clearly you subtract something to get in the middle. If you are starting with 10,655, clearly you add something. And everything here is spread over six months. So if I say spot one, one comma, zero, six, three, five, plus, I'm starting with this spot, I'm taking, I'm, I'm just taking four months. So I say four over six, 24 is for six months. So four over six multiplied by 0, 0,0024. 0, 0,0024. So you, you, you now have your expected features price equals this year plus open bracket 4 over 6 multiplied by this a close bracket. Are you not seeing? So this is the expected futures price. Now, can, uh, if, if I say expected futures price, I'm just saying this is the exchange rate we are going to use to exit the market. This is the exchange rate we are going to use when we exit the futures market. This is what we are going to use. So, so number of contracts then, you can now say number of contracts that we will then get if you are going to use this exchange rate. Number of contracts, number of contracts, we are now saying, remember you, are, you, you want to pay 5 million and 60 dollars. You can't divide these by 125, no, because these are Swiss francs. So you must convert dollars first to, to Swiss franc by using this exchange rate that we have just calculated, 0659. Now, if you convert these, they are now Swiss franc. So you then divide the answer that you get by 125, 123. First, convert your dollars to Swiss franc and then divide by the contract size. So you now get what equals 5060123 divided by this and then divide that again by 125, 123. So it's, you're, you're just going to get 38 contracts. Uh, you can see here that the, the, the fraction, the fraction is, is negligible if you, do, if you do it like this. And um, so these are 38 contracts. Say, so why are you working number of contracts? They are specifically asked by the examiner. Notice, the examiner is saying, Show all relevant calculations, including the number of contracts bought or sold. These, these words bought or sold, examiner is trying to, 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 to hint to you that they need to know whether you are, you, your market position is core, that is bought, or short, that is sell. Right? Then outcome. So we have answered the number of contracts. Then, then uh, HF cost from futures. From futures, we now want to find how much it would cost us. Uh, it'll be it'll be this divided by. Remember, from futures, we are saying when we exit, which exchange rate we, are we going to use? We are going to use this closing exchange rate. So it simply equals 5 million and 60. 5 million and 60 divided by this. So it will be 4 million. Uh, this is a cost. This is now Swiss francs. Again, I can say CHF. So say, can you, can you, can you pause again? Come again, what are you saying? I'm saying when we say closing futures price, we are simply saying the exchange rate we are going to use when we exit the market. Simple, 
So what will be the cost in Swiss franc? It will be our exposure divided by the exchange rate we are going to use when we close our, our position on the futures. So these are Swiss francs. Right, so forward is 4739. Futures is giving us what? 4750. So done. Let us now go to current options. Current options. Now, current options, you need to determine, are you going to go for a put option? Are you going to go for a call option? So let me pause a little bit. You need to ask yourself these questions. It, let it rhyme, let it rhyme, let it rhyme, let it rhyme. Oh, uh, uh, Kuzi, I'm, I'm seeing you raise the end. Can you unmute and... Excuse me, go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, I wanted sir. to ask uh, 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 by the contract uh, side. Contract. Number contract. contract. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you, Kuzi. Uh, why did we divide by... Um, the closing futures rate instead. I thought we divide by the spot rate, the current spot rate. Ah, not it's, you don't divide by the current spot rate because the futures market is a different market altogether. You know, as the spot rate is like the rate that is there today, but the futures market, it's a, it's, it's you are saying when I, when I age using futures market, this is what the exchange rate that I'm going to get, I'm going to use. We have estimated it. So it's like, suppose you are to, to, to get your, your, your Swiss franc from the futures market. They don't even know about the sport. It's a, tot, it's, a, it's, a, it's a market which functions itself separate from sport. But what, what, what you do is, the exchange rate that you use there is estimated. How? by the assumption that basis are going to move the spot price to futures price. So if you are terminating in between the basis or movement, where does it take the exchange rate to? That is now the closing futures price and that is the exchange rate you are going to use. I'm sure I've, 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 I've explained that. If you are if you are okay with the explanation, you let me know if it is in the chat. I will revisit that. Yes, sir. Okay. Current options. Okay, so I was saying, I want something to rhyme to rhyme. You know, currents they've got issues of put or, or calls. To put is to sell. To call is to buy. Okay, but let me let me let me. I'm sure you've played my videos in our WhatsApp class group. You see the videos, but let me repeat the lines I was saying. I said, if you are expecting to pay foreign currency, it means at a future date you need to buy that currency. So what do you do? Secure the right to buy, and that right to buy is called core option. I said, if you are expecting to receive a foreign currency it, at a future date, it means when you receive that foreign currency, you have to sell it to the bank to get your money, your actual currency. If you're expecting to receive foreign currency, it means after receiving it, you sell it. So when you're hedging using options, secure the right to sell, and that is called put option. But let me qualify this statement. This statement is only valid if, if your exposure currency is the same with your option currency, contract currency. This rhyming is valid if the exposure currency is the same with the contract currency, like you're expecting to pay US, so buy put option. I mean, buy core options for US if the options are priced in US. 
by price, I mean, if the contract size is in US. But in a situation where you are expecting to pay US and the contract size is in Swiss franc, you do the opposite. So instead of core option, you are going to go for put option. It's another, it's, it's another hint. Actually, if, 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 if on futures you have said sold, pay this attention. Perhaps it, it may help you. If on, if on futures you have said sell, it means on options you are also going to say put. Are you getting that? If on, op, if, if on futures, whether it's interest rate or what, if on futures you have said sell futures now, it means on options you are going to say put. Perhaps it can make your day very easy. If on futures you have said buy, on options you are going to say call. They go end in end. Or you go it like this. If I'm expecting to pay for a, a currency, I shall need to buy that currency. So I need to, to have a call option. But if the exposure currency is different from the contract size currency, I do the opposite. So instead of call, I'm going to for put. If that is troubling you much, just say it. What I have done on futures is the same as what I will do on options. Whether it's it, if on options, even on futures I said sell now, on options I should say put. If on futures I've said buy, on options I will say call. Is, isn't, it, isn't it like a better thing to get it that way? If, if, if you are getting it that way, pretty cool. You can say noted, say, you can type noted, say, whilst well, time I'm, I'm continuing. Okay, so what do you do? You come to the, you come to the question. These are our options. Now we know we go for calls. We go for calls. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a six month call. You don't go for a six month for three months. If, if your exposure is four months, you go for contracts which expire immediately after. So you say the firm buys, the firm buys, the firm buys six months, six months, uh, the firm buys six months put, six months put options now. Now, the firm buys six months put options now. Now, when it comes to, to when it comes to the issue of options, when it comes to the issue of options, there's an element of 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 choosing the strike price. You can't use both strike price. Suppose you are paying five million US. Which of the two strike prices do you choose? One comma zero six or one comma zero seven? Suppose you are paying the one that is quiet. You choose the price that uh, you, you, you you pay more. You expect pay more. Ah, remember, remember, this is not a spread exchange rate. No, I know, I know where you are getting that from. When the exchange rate is given, is like bid offer. That's where I said you choose the one that you, you pay more. But these are options. It's a strike price. It's not like bid or offer. If you are told to choose between 1,06 and 1,07, this is not like bid offer, the way you are getting your, yours from. No, these are totally two rates which are separate. Which one would you choose of the two? Meaning, you just divide into five million and see the one in which you pay less. You know the answer you told me about that is the it's it's where exchange rates are given as spread like bid offer. That's where I said when you are making a payment, choose the one in which you pay more. But these ones are not the bid offer thing. These are like exercise price. It's an option. Can you pay using one comma zero six or one comma zero seven? 
And if we are dividing these figures into 5 million, you will notice 1,07 allows us to pay less. So that's the option you would go for, the one which minimizes cost. Fine line there, we are not talking of bid offer. Right, so you are now saying a strike price, a strike price, a strike price of you go for a strike price of um, 1,07 is ideal as it minimizes, minimizes, um, minimizes the cost of payment. Is ideal as it may, it may it minimizes the cost of this particular payment. So. We want to edge, uh, so so you can simply say, uh, you can you can you can now simply say, number of contracts it's it's again thirty eight days before. Number of contracts, number of uh, contracts, number of contracts. Uh, if you had worked it already, and contract sizes are the same, so you can say thirty eight as before. This is the number of contracts. And then uh, <clears throat> CHF cost, CHF cost. Now, CHF cost, uh, we call this out, we call this, we call this options outcome. Options, oh, we can, let, let, let's say amount aged. Let me take it step by step. Amount aged. Amount aged. Now, if 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 you if 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 you want to see how much what what is the amount that you have aged, you know that you have got thirty eight contracts, and each contract is one twenty five thousand. One twenty five thousand, and you have used a strike price of one comma zero seven. So the amount that we have aged then becomes what? Equals 38, 38 times 125,000, that's the contract size, and then times 1,07. So oh, it's, 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 it's coming out, it's coming out as, Number of contracts, amount aged. Okay, let me. So, so we can we can still keep it that way. We can still keep it that way. So, what 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 you can see is there is an overage. If it's like this, there is an overage. You can make it an underage or overage. It is still fine. But in most in most instances, a. Uh, they make it under age, but still you can make it over age. So there's exposure. Okay. Um, exposure is 5 million, 5 million and 60. You can over age. So you can say here, over aged, over aged equals this year minus this please know for sure that there are two scenarios if we round our contracts like this you do notice that 38 contracts will take our tally to 5 million and 82 yet our exposure is 5 million and 60 so this one is overaged if we had rounded our contracts downwards to 37 this one was going to be underage. So expect that there's an overage and there's also underage. Now you may say, say that is this done with uh, with where with uh, this this is USD. Do we do this with futures? No. On futures there's nothing like underage or overage. We only do it normally with options. Now 
let us now look at what the outcome is going to be if you yield with options. So you say out, options outcome. Options outcome. Options outcome. So it will be like payment. Or the when when you say options outcome, everything now is in Swiss franc CHF. Pay attention to this part. You say cost of payment, cost of payment, cost of payment. It will be it will be equals. Remember, remember it's 38 contracts, so it's a matter of 38 multiplied by 125. 38 multiplied by 125, so this will be your cost of payment. 400, uh, it will be uh, 4, 4 million 750. And then you say, remember, for you to secure a right, for you to secure a right, because options are is a right, for you to secure a right, you pay a premium at the beginning. So if we say six month expiry, and we say it put six month expiry, so you pay this premium. Please pay attention. This premium is cents per Swiss franc, meaning these are US dollars. 2,06, uh, 2,63. These are cents, meaning US dollars per each Swiss franc. So you have to divide by 100 to give the, to put them to 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 to, to dollars because these are cents. So it works like this. You say premium, it adds to the cost. Premium. Look 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 on your screen. It's like this. How many contracts do I have? I have got 38 contracts. Each contract costing me how much? Each, each each contract with a price, with a size of 20, 20, 125,000. These are Swiss francs. And the premium is how much per, per Swiss franc for a six month put? For a six month put is 2,63. So I say times 2,63. Leave it open. Times 2,63. These are cents. I divide this by 100 to bring them to dollars. But my outcome here, my outcome is saying Swiss franc. So if I multiply by dollars, the answer I'm going to get here is dollars. So what I get from this, what I get from this is dollars. Let me repeat. Why are you saying it's dollars? Say because premium is cents per Swiss franc. So if I say 38 contracts times 125 times premium, I'm going to get dollars. But I'm calculating cost in Swiss francs. So what, what happens? What happens in practice is on the day I get to options market, they will say pay a premium. And remember, I am in Switzerland. So I they calculate a premium like this, and it's in dollars. But I am in Switzerland. So the cost to me is. By this spot was I'm, I'm doing it on the date I get to the contract. So I have to divide this by the spot rate was I'm doing it on the day I get to. To the futures to the options market, so they will tell me that look you need so much US and this is the spot. 1,0635 to put it in Swiss franc. Let me repeat. Because it's not like contracts premium is always in dollars. They, they have told us in this particular question that it's in cents, meaning dollars. So when I calculate here, I get dollars. But remember, I'm in Switzerland. I pay this on spot. So it will be equals 38 multiplied by 125,000 multiplied by 2,63. Multiply by, uh, I mean, divide by 100 and then multiply by 1,0635, like this. So this is my premium. Oh, I said multiply by here. I wanted to say divide by. 
So this is the premium. You get that? What else? You, you know what? If it was a receipt, the premium is subtracted. If it was a receipt, we are adding the premium because it's a payment. Then overage. Overage. The amount we overaged, we then convert it using forward rate. Convert it. It's, it's converted normally using forward. Why overaging? Because contracts are of standard sizes. And because contracts are of standard sizes, uh, you can't you round them to the nearest whole number, so you can end up overaging. So we overaged this amount, twenty two five hundred, and we convert it using forward rate. Forward rate is uh, we saw it somewhere. The forward rate is one comma zero six seven seven here. Yeah. 1,0677. So it equals because we are payment and we are making a payment and we overage it, so we subtract it. So we are saying this here over one. If it was in underage, you would add it 0, 1,0677. Why is it? Uh, why is it subtracted? Because it's, we are making a payment and we overaged it, so we take it out. If we, if it was an underage, suppose you said 37 contracts, this would add to cost because it was aged using forward. So if you tally this up, you then get what is called, uh, this is now options outcome. So if, if you are then asked to recommend appropriate aging strategy, you then come up with a summary. In a, because the, your question will normally put it in a report. So I would recommend you to say summary like this. Summary. This is now in your word processor. Where you say, in your word processor, you simply say, computations in Appendix 1 produce the following outcomes so you say aging method aging method you say aging method and then outcome it's now in your word processor after you've done all workings in appendix one so outcome is in chf swiss frank so there are three aging choices forward uh, two current features three uh, current options like this. So what are the outcomes? You simply take the outcomes like like uh, the outcome for the for the options. We just have it. The outcome for the futures. You go to the futures. Uh, we have it here. Then the outcome for the forward. You go for the forward. You know, if you are writing a report, this is how you do it. If you are writing a report, outcome for the forward, you take the forward. And then you will comment of the three, which one is ideal. It's a matter of checking which one minimizes cost. So you, you go with the forward there. Because forward has got least cost of payment to the firm. It was, it, if it was a receipt, you'd go with futures. Now, if you are reading a marking scheme and you see examiner trying to uh, explain also our benefits of futures and stuff, this is for the marking scheme. You don't have time in the world for you to begin to comment options unless it's specifically asked. Why do examiners put that? It's because that is for the examiner. Examiners put answers from a range of students. So you may see the examiner saying benefits of forward, disadvantages of forward, benefits of futures, disadvantages of futures, etc. What is all that? Be? Why all that? It's because answers from different students. You know, there is own figure rule in AFM. So suppose you had made a mistake and futures, they give you list. You would go for futures and you still get the answer correct from own figure rule. We only... We deduct max where you made the error, but if you proceed to use the same number, answer correctly as if you have not made that error, we give you subsequent marks. So examiners, marking scheme has got all that in mind. No wonder why the answer is so detailed. 
We don't expect you as a single student to write an answer which will reflect a range of students. No. So don't make it a critical success factor to have your answer discursively, which is to the extent of the marking scheme. But don't ignore discursive parts of the question when they are specifically asked. Continuing. Uh, so that one is done. Uh, uh, the first 15 marks and now swap arrangement. The swap arrangement now. You know, swap is basically in this in this case, it's an interest rate swap, meaning we want to, to, to we, we, we want to take a 60 million uh, Swiss franc loan in four months time again. Uh, I mean, it's a four year 60 million loan. But you know, because interest rates may fluctuate, so what we want to do is to enter into an interest rate swap. How does the swap arrangement works? It, 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 if you want to get a loan, you go to the bank and tell them, look, I will get a loan in four months time, but yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not sure about the interest rate movement, so can you arrange a swap for me? Because you don't know who to exchange with, but the banks know because they give loans to a lot of people. So the bank will act as an intermediary. So a swap is an over-the-counter derivative contract, an interest rate swap, in which parties pay each other's interest on, nom on notional amounts. That is interest rate swap. We can have currency swaps. We can have a lot of other swaps. But the bank, because it, 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 it forms the meeting place between me and the counterparty, it requires a commission. It charges us. And the swap contract may determine how charges are to be levied and how the benefits from the swap are to be shared, are to be shared. Benefits arise from interest rate differentials in a swap between fixed and floating because we are paying each other. So if if if, if mine is 11 percent, yours is 8 percent, mine floating is 11, yours fixed is eight. If we exchange, there's an interest rate differential of 3%. This is the source of the benefit. And then how this benefit is to be shared depends on circumstances. Ideal interest rate swaps are normally a situation where one party pays someone's fixed rate and another someone's float. And the float is normally the LIBOR or interbank rate. So you will be given that this firm is a, it pays at interbank rate plus at interbank rate plus that is the the interbank part of it is the floating rate. You may pay someone's floating rate in exchange of that person paying you your fixed rate. Or if you have got different floating rates, you can pay each other's floating rates. These two different rates, the bank will make it possible for you. So basically, there are two parties to an interest rate swap. So interest rate swap interest rate swap uh, so we do have cmc uh, this this is our company cmc and then there's a counterparty this counterparty is another company which the bank has found for us to swap with counterparty and then there is uh, there's CMC counterpart and then there's interest rate differentials. Differentials. Interest rate differentials. Together. Right, so for this particular loan, a counterparty, they're saying an interest rate swap with the counterpart uh, where, where the counterpart can borrow at an annual floating rate of uh, yield curve plus 0.8 basis points. So we can say floating rate here. If they are to swap floating rates, how, would it look, how, would, how will it look like? Floating rates, counterparty, they are telling us that the counterpart is yield curve plus 8%. So it's like yield, yield plus 0.8%. That's what the counterpart will pay. Yeah, it's facing. 
But what, what is CMC facing on that loan? Uh, CMC is facing yield curve plus 40. Yield curve, yield plus 0.4%. That's what CMC is facing. So what is the differential? Differential, it's, it's, it's basically, now notice, notice as you can see here, if, if, if CMC is to pay, it will lose in this case. CMC, to, it, if, it is, if it is to pay counterparty's yield, it, there, will be, there, will be, there will be a difference of minus 0, 0.4%. It will lose, you can see. If CMC is to pay this, it will lose. Now, let us go to floating rates, fixed rates. Fixed rates. Fixed rates, CMC is 2.2%. 2.2%. And then counterparty's fixed rate is, counterparty's fixed rate is uh, what? Counterparty's fixed rate is 3.8%. 3.8%. Now, because we are now talking of fixed rates, the counter, if, if counterparty is to pay CMC's fixed rate, the counterparty is going to gain. So you say equals, it's going to gain 1.6%. 1.6%. So what it this is called this is called a swapping table. It, it it tells us how we are going to proceed with the swap. And if if you are if, if you money if you find you have problems with the swap with this table, it's what one comma one comma six percent. If you are having problems with this table, know that just know that the interest rate differentials are netted. The interest rate differentials are netted so that you get what is called benefit. Uh, benefit like this. Then this benefit is to be shared. So this uh, benefit is basically the sum. Let me let me do this. It's the sum. Now what this company is doing now is it is going to charge commission to each party before we share the benefits. The bank is going to say, because I have made it possible for you to swap, pay me commission. And the commission is 20 basis points to each part. So, commission here is uh, 0,2%. Uh, so, so, yeah. Oh, they are saying benefits are to be shared. What? Both parties will equally benefit from the swap. So we can spread this benefit to say 0,6% because they are benefiting equally. If they say one gets 70%, you just share it also 70%. So let us take out commission that we are going to pay to the bank for arranging the swap, the bank is going to get a commission for arranging the swap minus 0.2%. That's what they mean by 20 basis points, minus 0.4%. Then we have got the net benefit. This is now the net benefit. Uh, does it tally my figures up? Oh, no. The net benefit is. Okay. All right. So this is the net benefit. All right. Net benefit. Now, questions on swaps, notice, questions on swaps are normally answered like this. 
Uh, let me interpret the figures for you. The net benefit, these net benefits are annual benefits. It means the interest rate which CMEC is going to, to, to pay, it will be reduced by 0.4% as a benefit from the swap. The interest that CMEC was going to pay, it is going to be reduced by 0.4% as a result of the swap. Because we are being told that it's being shared equally, no wonder why we are spread it equally. Now, you can actually have monetary amounts of these figures to say, to multiply these figures to say, you know, we were saying if this pays, if this pays, you, 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 because we are not given the yield curve, we, we could have monetary figures to say CMC, if it, it, if it is going to pay counterparties, this was going to be the cost. You can put actually monetary amounts from the swap. If counterpart was to pay CMEC, this was going to be the cost. So the net benefits were like this. And then commission, we can express it also as a percentage to get the net benefit in monetary terms. But all that is time consuming and I don't recommend that. What I recommend is when you are answering a question on swap, just to prepare your swapping arrangement here and then comment and say, thus, the interest expected on the, the interest rate expected on the loan will reduce by the net benefit over the uh, uh, over the swap uh, net benefit from the swap arrangement over the period that will be it you still get full credit from this from just from this you still get full credit so Say, I'm working in a question paper and I realized that the examiner has done that thing again and proceeded to do cash flow analysis of that thing. It's because the marking scheme is for various students. Certain students can do this on a piece of paper and compute on monetary basis, on monetary basis. Or like instead of saying basis minus uh, zero comma commission minus zero comma two percent, they will be multiplying on the actual loan itself and multiply by four over twelve. Um, uh, multiply by uh, sold by by the period of the loans and stuff. So that one, it's time consuming. And normally you may say, say after doing questions, I realize that swap qu questions on swap are normally for loans which are more than a year. Why is it questions on swap? I don't get them for loans of six months. If a loan is for nine months, it's either forward rate arrangement, interest rate futures. Yes, because a swap contract, a, an interest rate swap, is, 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 it requires a series of cash flows over an extended period of time. No wonder why swaps are very difficult to arrange in a capital market. Why? They are not exchange traded. Exchange traded markets open and close every day. So you can get futures for three months. You can get options for three months, but swaps are over the counter derivatives. They are normally fixed for loans extending over a large period of time. So they are not, they are really, uh, you, you really get swaps. So I want you to just analyze your swap like this. Don't focus or don't proceed to cash flow analysis of that. When you see that being done, it's because the answers are presented in different ways by the students, unless it's specifically asked. But in most instances, they are, the examiner is, the marking scheme is accommodating all students. No wonder why they may say alternatively, or here they may say cash flow impact of this. Right. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I need to finish this whole question. Uh, I don't need to, anything left? Okay, yes, there's some one part left. As an alternative to paying the principal, uh, uh, concerning swap, concerning swap, please, don't leave any question unanswered and don't, you know that all sections are compulsory. Don't say, oh, say question one, one there was a swap and I got lost. No, 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 these are the main takeoffs. Compare the interest rates between the firm and its counterpart and get the differentials. Now you may say, say you put minus 40. Well, suppose you have forgotten which one do I have to put negative? Which one do I have to put positive? Let me say I put 40 like this. Suppose I, I, didn't, I didn't know which one do I have to, to, to say negative or positive. 
after this, after you've gotten the interest rates, know for sure that the differential benefits are netted. Why netting? Because if one is benefiting, the other is losing. So the be differential benefits are netted. So even if you don't know which one was negative, you can simply say equals net, meaning subtract them. This one minus this. So you can still proceed like this. Key thing, differential benefits are netted. Another thing, another thing you may say, say, I get you right, differential benefits are netted by, by but why not netting minus 0 0.4, uh, I mean 0 0.4 minus, because we can net the other way. Why not netting the other way, say, to say 0 0.4 minus this and we get a negative here. That one, we don't do it that way because in a swap, the bank convinces you, you, myself and you, the counterpart, the bank will convince us that we are going to benefit. We can't go in a swap where we are going to lose knowingly. Does it make sense? Going in a swap where you know you are going to lose. So no wonder why the net differential benefit is always positive. Why is it positive? It's because we. this is an over-the-counter derivative. It's a negotiated thing. So we can't negotiate something and sign on to it when we know we are going to lose. No wonder why differential benefit makes sure that it's always positive. I'm sure I've explained. I know you had these hidden questions, but you couldn't. Maybe perhaps you could not ask them. Confirm you have noted the basics of swap. When you are playing this video, you know it's it's about two hours towards the end. Just I will upload it. I'm sure I have to upload it because I used less Shona today. When I use less Shona, I upload it because. Some may not even understand Shona. So I will upload it. So when you are playing this, when you want to know about swap, I will I will comment in the in the description of the video that swap is included so that you know which video talks about swaps. Confirm later that you have noted things about swap. Let us quickly go to the last. Uh, they are saying as an alternative to paying the principal on the loan is one lump sum payment at the beginning of the year. CMC could pay off the loan in four equal, you know, in four equal installments. In other words, it has to be amortized. In this case, annual interest rate of 2% would be payable, which is the same as the gross redemption yield. Now, calculate modified duration on the loan. Modified duration. So you know what modified duration is. So let us calculate it first. Modified duration equals. You need to have this formula. I'm, I'm sure you now know. Modified duration. Modified duration equals. You know, it's 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 Macaulay duration. Macaulay duration. Uh, you divide that by one plus gross redemption yield. One plus gross redemption yield. Uh, gross redemption yield. Please remember this formula. Uh, you lose max uh, without uh, easy max. You can lose them. Now Macaulay duration, mark day. You now know how Macaulay duration is calculated. Mark day equals, uh, I said you say sum of sum of PV times T, sum of PV uh, times T divided by sum of PV, sum of PV, sum of PV times T divided by sum of PV. Now, a annual installment, annual, installment annual installment how do you calculate annual installment on an amortized loan you simply say the loan amount which is 60 million you divide that by the annuity factor of the loan is paying they are saying the loan is paying interest of two percent which is the same as gross redemption yield 
So if I come to the tables, I need to take annuity for 2% four years, annuity, 2% four years, which is 3,808. So I come here and say 3,808. Then what do I get? I say equals 60 divided by 3,808. So this is the annual loan installment. So, so this is what I will be paying every year. So I say year, year one, two, three, four. Year one, two, three, four. Remember, when you are calculating duration, year is our T. Year is what we are referring to as T. Then we have got cash flow. Cash flow. We'll be, what, we'll be paying this amount every year. Uh, we'll be paying this amount every year. You get that? This amount is what we'll be paying every year. And then uh remember we want to find uh, they are saying gross redemption yield is the one we use when you are calculating a uh, duration so we say um, uh, discounting factor it uh, discounting factor at two percent it's a matter of uh, you know because one over one comma zero two to the power of the year remember this is how we get discounting factors and then you say pv 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 i'm applying this here multiply by that all right then you have sum of PV, sum, sum of PV, sum of PV, you are now saying equals this, equals sum, open bracket, close bracket. So actually this was supposed to be 60 million, it's because of rounding off, but it doesn't matter. Because sum of PV of a loan, that is current price. It was supposed to be 60 million, but because the annuity is rounded off, no wonder why it's 59999 and this stuff. And then PV times T. We, we, we first calculate Macaulay duration for us to proceed to get modified duration. So PV times T, we are now saying this PV multiplied by this T, which is here. Remember that from our last week's discussion? You should be singing this stuff because you earn easy marks. So you say sum of PV times T. PV times T. Uh, you, you, are, you are now, it's, it's a matter of adding this, these figures up. Now, uh, you now have sum of PV and sum of PV times T. So you can now have mark day, mark a duration. Mark D equals sum of PV times T. So mark D, you say equals this year over this. It's given in years. So this is years. Then modified duration. Modified duration, it's Macaulay duration divided by modified duration, Macaulay duration. Modified duration, we are now simply saying equals um, Macaulay duration over one plus gross redemption yield. So it's two comma four eight. We written, we have written the formula already divided by one comma zero two. Close bracket. So you are saying equals this divided by one comma zero two. So these are this is our our modified duration. You can give it as years or some can give it as a percentage. 
it's still the same. What it means is how many marks were allocated to this part of the question? OK, so you see we have done all these questions on majors and acquisitions for Geo and Tori. All these are in, my, in our videos. They are all answered, especially this one. For Geo and Tori, please. Um, if you haven't played the video on corporate reconstruction, you have to. My video, uh, actually, I need, I need my video on this one. I did send these videos in the, I did send these videos in the previous lesson. There's a video where I say majors and acquisitions, reconstruction and there's an illustration. You will see in that video, we did seven questions from past exam papers, all dedicated to majors and acquisitions. So even if you say, I don't know what, 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 what to tackle on majors and acquisitions, just go on that video, relax, you are super sorted. Go on that video, relax, super sorted. We, 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 we don't we don't have a problem on that. Or sell off, carve out, spin offs. It's well explained in that video. Well, you know, I got oh, as I said, we, we we want to beat last period pass mark. We, we we actually want to beat it because we realized that we were oh actually we were quite we were we were we were the the the, the, the college with highest passes in AFM in September. In Southern Africa, actually, not just in Zim. So basically, I, I, I'm priding myself on that. And and when I mention a video to say go on that particular video, please, that is the path of least resistance. At least you have confidence of your tutor. You you don't have a situation where I don't know what my tutor will put it like. And I've already given you papers that we have to complete to the comma to the last paragraph, to everything. Make sure you're going through that. Even if you can feel like studying something else, go through what I've given you. And if you are lacking confidence, if there are instances where ride on your sales confidence to say, ah, oh, well, this is what I was told to do. Let me focus on this and see how it goes. Okay, uh, so yeah, it was, oh, I was checking on something. Yeah. You know, when students you are writing exams yourself, everything that, that I come across. You know, even this Buran company, this question is about adjusted present value. Make sure you know how to calculate APV. Notice adjusted present value. So this paper, yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool, easy stuff. We have videos where everything here is explained, apart from question number one only. No wonder why I, to, I, want to, I had to choose it. Um, so, um, having noticed that this paper, this question on modified duration at seven marks, so you can see perhaps after calculating duration, modified duration, you will now have five. You need to comment. You need to comment and say modified duration, modified duration, uh, measures the sensitivity sensitivity of uh, bonds value bonds value to a change in interest rate. Remember also from one of our revision videos, you realized that if a bond is a zero coupon bond, its marker duration is the number of years. If a bond doesn't pay interest, suppose it's a zero coupon bond repayable after five years, marker duration is five years without any, any. Check on our first revision video on bonds, the one we did some two weeks back. Check on that. You can play that out. That was to a change in interest rates. Actually, to a change in interest rate, thus, thus, comma, a modified duration, 
specified duration of 2,43 implies that implies uh, that if interest rates were to change, interest rate rates were to change, were to change, comma, the bond is value value will change by so you, you can simply say change in price change in p change in price that's the bond value it will be equal to remember remember there's an inverse relationship between bond is price and interest rates meaning if interest rates are increasing, PV is falling. If interest rates are falling, PV is increasing. So that in that in inverse relationship, you can say minus modified day. It will be equals to minus modified day multiplied by change in interest in interest multiplied by current price, which is 60 million. Multiplied by current price, which is 60 million. That is how the, the, the change is going. So that's how we use modified duration in practice. OK, so I have, uh, I know as your tutor, you can see, you can see as your tutor, I have a lot of things to say. I really do. A, I'm trading a fine path here. When I'm saying for the other questions, go and visit. I'm trading a fine pathway in as much as I want to do questions, but I don't want you to panic. You have to promise me that you are following the script. If say says, please do this particular video topic, you are also following this. Script. There's nothing you can lose. There's nothing to lose by just being obedient for a week, just a week just a week because you have a lot of things to do you need to be guided otherwise these final stretches we can again end up disappointing us so i marked earlier you may say say what was the purpose of today's vision number one don't underestimate theory parts discursive parts we have you have noticed they are they they are sources of easy marks that's number one number two if you noticed that if uh, imagine imagine if you were performing calculations and you have not yet written the memo that was on part d with all this yeaging computations and stuff are you not seeing that when you come to part d which is theory you will be tired already number one number two your mind will be mixed up easy marks like how to mitigate urgent issues you would lose you, you your mind cannot even tell you those answers because you have started with computations or you, you have seen it from my videos that when there's a discussing part of the question which is devoid of calculations meaning which does not relate to the calculations start with that first whilst your mind is is, is relaxing while anxiety is checking out start with that you'll be starting with typing whilst you on the back of your mind you're thinking that is a current future what did my say say you are doing nicely, answers will be coming. Once you are busy typing easy stuff, easy stuff, easy stuff, it's possible because each question is got one word document. So you go to the area where you, you, are, you are comfortable with, whilst you are thinking the other stuff. That way you calm yourself down and you, have, you wrap your head around the exam and we have a firm handle on the exam. Otherwise, you'll be like 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 anxious and you may lose easy marks so you have seen it that it works in this video because yet we started with this and now say oh tapua let us now do the memo even you are, your mind is already tired the same thing will happen in an exam if you start with workings where they are discursive parts of the question which are which have nothing to do with your workings start with those it's like Suppose the company was saying calculate, the question was saying calculate base case in PV, and then amongst the other questions is saying discuss the assumptions made. 
B part has got nine marks, which is saying discuss the assumptions made in calculating base case NPV. So you can see I can answer B even without calculating the base case NPV because assumptions have nothing to do with the calculation. I know the assumptions from the scenario, so I can already type the assumptions whilst on, I'm thinking, uh, how do I calculate base case NPV? Is that loan amortized? Is it not? How do I calculate subsidy benefit? Whilst I'm typing the assumptions made, by the time I get to the nine marks of typing the assumptions, I'm now in a clearer picture to tackle the calculative uh, or qual uh, 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 the, this calculations part of the question. You get that? Okay. Uh, can you imagine? This 50 mark question was supposed to take us one hour, 30 minutes. And you notice I, I didn't start by doing it right away. I started by discussing something else where I was, I was marking on the state extent of our, of our visions. We now need to progress to mock two, to mock three now. As you have noticed on the learning platform, mock three doesn't have any PDF of the answer. PDF of the mock, it doesn't have anything. Why? Efforts, effort has been made to make mock three look like the real exam is possible. So you, there's nothing you can print on the mock three. It's like as, as, as exam as possible. So you can defer writing mock three, say, to Sunday, but don't stretch it to when is the next week, otherwise you panic. Can you now do your housekeeping? Try by all means to Play your sales videos, get if especially the ones I have identified, and consider mock three to be an exam. Give nothing to chance with the internet or stuff. Make sure all that is in order before you tackle mock three. And then it will be all smiles. Believe you me, you can see just, just to check on your sales confidence. I, I, I really know that you're going to make it. I'm not even doubting. I'm not even wishing. There's nothing to wish. There's an element of knowing. So make sure, make sure you bring it. Even if you want to fail, ask yourself, what about my say? What is it that is causing you to lose marks? Because the company is telling you that they want to change, they want to change the shareholding. They want to hire a venture capitalist, and the venture capitalist is going to bring debt. This same venture capitalist is going to bring capital. And now with that shareholding structure is going to change from 50, the family owned thing is going to change from 55% to this. And then uh, this is the current statement of financial position before the venture capitalist brings the money and before the reorganization. And this then required um, prepare, uh, compute whether someone has gained from the arrangement or percentage gain statement of financial positions before or after. Take a deep breath. Don't start computations if there are questions with theory. Go through questions and then theory parts, they give you comfort, you relax. But as you are typing and relaxing in theory parts, take note of time. If the theory part is 10 marks, it has to be typed in just 18 minutes. 1,8 minutes per mark. When 18 minutes clocks move on to the next. So don't say, 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 tackle theory, and then you tackle theory questions ignorant of time. Otherwise, you, 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 we, we then box ourselves in the predicament again. To the extent, you can see your say talks too much. Mm, 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 mm. And I, it will be like I'm wired. I'm in an AFM tunnel. I, I I don't know what 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 I will be taking. What I'm talking is coming from. So to the extent of that, you have a, a continued and consistent revision sessions. Play your sales videos in a controlled environment, meaning noises and stuff. Try by all means to 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 to, to mitigate. Uh, I'm at, at my town office and I need to get home now. Uh, enjoy, team. Enjoy. Don't worry, your say doesn't go anywhere. When I see something pops up, I bring it up like this. Bye. Bye. Thank you.